All right, so the first lesson here is about alkane. Okay, I'll talk about what an alkane is. So the goal today, first of all, is to name using IUPAC nomenclature of alkanes. And then we'll talk about the reactions of alkanes and what structural isomers are. So first of all, this unit is called organic chemistry. So what do we mean by the word organic? If you go to the supermarket, you can find organic produce. Okay, there's a section labeled organic. You can have all kinds of fruits and vegetables. Uh, we have an idea what that means, uh, but that's not what we're talking about. Okay, organic in chemistry has nothing to do with how fruit is grown. Organic simply means if you have carbon. Okay, Technically, organic refers to living things. If something can be found in a living organism, that's organic. And well, how do we figure that out? Carbon, okay, because life is carbon-based. Every single life form that we know of has carbon in it. Uh, carbon is vitally important because of its versatility in terms of bonding. So we define organic as something that contains carbon atoms. Now, there are exceptions. Carbon dioxide is an exception. Okay, we don't consider CO2 to be organic. And then also carbonates. CO3, uh, two minus, uh, like calcium carbonate, chalk, we don't consider that to be organic, but everything else with carbon are organic molecules. And there are many different kinds of organic compounds. Okay, there are over 8 million now. It is not feasible to learn all of them. And I don't think anyone knows all of them. We are going to pick a small set of all the organic compounds, some of which are common substances. Um, some are unfamiliar to you, but they all follow a certain pattern. So that's why we're able to learn them. Okay, so carbon is our protagonist for this unit. It is the backbone, quite literally the backbone of organic chemistry. Uh, because we'll actually be talking about the backbone of chemical compounds. All right, so when we learn about organic molecules, we have to learn about hydrocarbons. Okay, and a hydrocarbon, as the name would suggest, is made up of carbon and hydrogen and nothing else. You don't need oxygen for something to be a hydrocarbon. And if you have a hydrocarbon, you can have different kinds of uh, shapes and orientations. They could form just a straight line, or it could be branched, or it could be in a ring. All right, so you can see that there are two branches, or well, two straight hydrocarbons, and a ring. And you can have single, double, or triple bonds. Okay, any one of those can exist in a hydrocarbon. So in the first picture, you have a double bond. The second one is purely single bond. The third one, the ring, um, you see those dashed lines? Remember in the last unit we learned about resonance? Well, that's what they are. That's a resonance structure, meaning that some of these bonds are actually double bonds. All right, so um, what do we mean by alkanes? Because the topic of this lesson, well, we introduce organic chemistry and then we start learning about alkanes. So an alkane is a hydrocarbon that is saturated. Okay, if you learn biology, uh, this is uh, quite easy to understand because you learn about lipids and saturated hydrocarbons. If you didn't learn biology, well, just think about what the word saturated means. Okay? It means full. If a hydrocarbon is saturated, that means you are full of hydrogens. Every single bond between the carbons are single bonds. Okay, no double bonds no triple bonds, meaning that you are bonded to the maximum number of hydrogens possible. You can't literally have more because you don't have the bonds to have those hydrogens. Whereas if you have, let's say, double or triple bonds, you can still break those bonds and make more bonds with hydrogen, so you're not saturated with hydrogen. You could have more. So if you have a saturated hydrocarbon, we call those alkanes, okay? meaning all single bonds between the carbon atoms. In the table, we have 10 basic alkanes, their prefixes, and their formulas. You must know these by heart, 
Okay, you won't have uh, like a table to refer to on a test. So you just have to know the first 10 prefixes. Now notice that these prefixes are different from the ones you learn in grade 10. In grade 10, you also learn prefixes 1 to 10 when you have to name compounds like mono, di, tri, tetra, penta. Well, if you just take a look at this one, it's a little bit different. The first four are different. But from five and onwards, it's exactly the same. Okay. So one is meth. I know some of you are giggling right now. I know what you're thinking. Meth, that's exactly what it is. Okay. Um, the illicit drug, meth, why is it called meth and not anything else? Well, it comes from the word methamphetamine. The meth actually does refer to a methane on the structure. Okay. Methamphetamine has CH3 attached to it. So that's where you get the name from. We just call it meth for sure. You're not, you don't want to say the whole word. So that's exactly what that comes from. So meth refers to one. Okay. Methane is natural gas, CH4. It's called methane because it has one carbon in it. Now two would be F. Okay. Ethane, then you have two carbons. A uh, prop is three. Uh, propane is a common word. If you just go to a gas station, you can basically buy propane, and that is a gas used as fuel for certain uh, vehicles. Butane is also a substance that we can burn. Um, but refers to four. Okay, a lot of people barbecue and you know, have hot pot using a can of butane gas. Now, the first four are special, you just have to know the new names. But pent is five, like the pentagon, like pentakill, if you play video games, pent literally means five. Hex, like a hexagon, refers to six, so hexane. Hept is seven, oct, like an octopus, octagon, that's eight. Non, you know, nine, non. And then dec, well, a decade in English is 10 years. A decimeter, that is 10 millimeters. So dec means 10, so a decane, 10. You just have to find a way to remember the 10 prefixes. I don't care how you do it, there are some tricks. But um, yeah, like it doesn't take long to memorize these. We're gonna be using the base names a lot, okay? And also the formulas, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the formulas and what those numbers are, but the meth, eth, pro, but, those refer to the number of carbons, okay? You can see, go down the list, you have one carbon, two, three, four, five, all the way to 10. The amount of hydrogens, that's related to the amount of carbons with the formula, which we will learn a little bit later. In the next column, you have the alkyl group. Now, if you take, let's say, a methane, okay, that is an alkane, you remove one hydrogen from that methane. Instead of CH4, you have CH3 with the line coming out that refers to an additional bond that the carbon is now free to make. A carbon can make four bonds, four of them are with hydrogen, you're a methane. If you have three hydrogens, then you have one available. Now you are able to bond with anything. So this is an alkyl group and not just methane. You can do this for all of the uh, alkanes that you have. You can just remove a hydrogen. Now that carbon is free to make another bond. So you become an alkyl group, methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl, and so on and so on. Okay, so you can make a alkyl group if you just remove a hydrogen. Now, what do they look like? So we learn about Vesper and we learn about Lewis diagram. So we are able to draw these in 2D and 3D. Well, if you draw them on paper, that's a Lewis diagram. It's all gonna be 90 degrees from each other. And we learned that this is not true. So take methane, for example. The Vesper diagram is the one shown on the left with the bond angle of 109.5 degrees, that's the most accurate representation of methane. In figure A, you have CH4, that's the molecular formula. It tells you nothing about the shape. In B, you have the Lewis diagram, which has right angles between the hydrogen, which is not right, okay, because methane is not a flat molecule. Well, C and D, you have molecular models. 
And there are two types of models. In figure C, you have the ball and stick model. It refers to the balls and the sticks that you know, connects them. And then D is space filling model. And which one do you prefer? Well, for me, it depends on the situation. What purpose do I have for these molecules? If I'm just trying to make the PowerPoint pretty to show you what certain molecule look like, I always use the space filling model because I, they look like real molecules. Atoms are spherical. And if you have a molecule, they overlap in their orbitals. So they actually does look something like that in those shapes. So that's a more realistic representation. I use those whenever I want to represent a molecule. Now the ball and stick model, I prefer when I try to show you the structure. Like in organic chemistry, we need to learn the structure. So we'll be using a lot of ball and stick models instead of the space filling because it doesn't really show the structure well. And if you look at the molecule on the bottom, it has seven carbons and all hydrogens attached. That is heptane, okay, a seven carbon chain. Notice the angles between the bonds. They are not 90 degrees, okay? They make a zigzag. So you have to keep that in mind. This is in three dimensions. You have tetrahedrals everywhere. So make sure that when you draw these structures, um, you know that this is a zigzag, so you draw the zigzag. And also when you look at a Lewis diagram, you have to realize that it's not 90 degrees, it's a zigzag. Okay, so that is the accurate representation right here. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, for the bottom one, you said it's heptane, right? Yes. Uh, uh, how did you know it's heptane? Like? Uh, because I counted the number of carbons. The black balls represent carbon and the white ones represent hydrogen. Okay, that's the convention for uh, the models that we use. It's color coded. So I counted seven black balls, seven carbons connected to each other. So it must be heptane. Okay. All right, that's a good question. All right, so you don't want to draw pictures. Okay, so there are other ways of representing structures. You can represent, for example, butane, C4H10, in four different ways. The first way is just to draw the full structure. That is the Lewis structure, like this. You display all of the atoms, carbon, hydrogen, all of them are drawn down and you connect them with single bonds. Okay, so that is something that we've learned already. So Lewis structures show everything. This will quickly become cumbersome because if you have a big molecule, and you're asked to draw this molecule, it's gonna get very annoying because you have to draw all those carbons and hydrogens and that's a waste of time. Nobody likes that one. So therefore we invented a lazy way of drawing this. So this is skeleton structures, all right? In skeleton structures, well, it literally just looks like this, a zigzag. You have to learn how to read this. The corners in the middle is the two points, those represent a carbon and the two ends on each side that's also a carbon so there's a total of four carbons in here you don't actually write any letters so the carbons are implied and so are the hydrogens right, so the only thing you actually see is the carbon backbone the hydrogens are invisible and they're implied because you can deduce the amount of hydrogens based on the location of the bond for example, um, you know that there is a carbon here. I'm gonna label that right there. Well, how many hydrogens does that carbon have? Well, look at how many bonds it's making. It is making one bond with this carbon in the middle. So that means it has three other bonds not shown. And you can assume that the not shown bonds are just hydrogen. So that one has three hydrogens. The carbon in the middle well, is making two bonds, one with the carbon to the left, another bond with the carbon to the right. So two bonds are made with carbon, so you have two bonds available, and those will be hydrogens. Okay, you don't actually have to write the hydrogens, we can just deduce how many hydrogens exist on each carbon. So this is it, that's literally all you need, just a zigzag, and that represents butane. And this is my favorite way of representing organic molecules. That's most people's favorite way because it's just so simple. 
And for this unit, I'll mostly be using the skeleton structure for simplicity. When I ask you to draw, well, you actually can't draw on Google Form, but in a normal class, I would ask students to draw. Um, you would be drawing the skeleton because why do you hate yourself? All right, so um, you can have also a condensed structure. Well, a condensed structure looks something like that. Okay, it shows all the carbons and all the hydrogens, but instead of drawing, you just write them out right next to each other. So CH3, well, that would be the carbon on the ends, because you have carbon bonded to one carbon, that means three hydrogens. And then CH2, CH2 in the middle. Uh, you can have a dash uh, to represent a bond or not. It doesn't really matter. So those are condensed structures, and I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, sometimes we use condensed structure to, or, uh, to represent organic compounds like acetic acid, for instance, instead of using a molecular formula, because this does give you information about the structure. Now, the last one is the molecular formula. This is the worst one if you want to know the structure. C4H10. I said the only information it tells you is that this guy has four carbons and 10 hydrogens. It doesn't tell you the structure. So in fact, this could be two different things. You can you know, rearrange them in two different ways and get C4H10. So again, if you learn biology, uh, glucose is a good example. C6, H12O6, okay, that's the chemical formula for glucose. But that's also fructose, that's also galactose. So all of these are isomers with each other. They're similar in structure, but they're not identical. So that doesn't really tell you much. Okay, so we assume glucose is six, uh, C6H12O6, but in fact, that could be two other things, but we just never mentioned them because glucose is the common one that we want to refer to. But yeah, this is ambiguous. This is not helpful in terms of structure. So we prefer skeleton in organic chemistry. All right, so, so far we've been dealing with just regular alkanes with a long chain and that's it. But you can have side branches. Okay, so now it becomes a little bit more complicated. Like I said before, you can take an alkane, chop off a hydrogen, you would have an alkyl group. Like a methane, you chop off a hydrogen to become methyl. And then you can take that methyl and stick it to something else. And these are what constitutes the branches of an organic compound. Like that one, it's called a substituent group. Because it makes a substitution with a hydrogen on your branch. Okay, so in the picture to the right, you have a butane four carbon backbone with one branch sticking out on top. There was a hydrogen, but you substituted that for a methyl group, so that's your substituent. Okay, so you can have multiple branches, which is why organic uh, chemistry is very difficult. You can have all kinds of different structures then. This is just one of literally millions of different possibilities. And we're gonna have to learn how to name a specific set of these, okay? We're gonna have to follow a lot of rules. And you must follow these rules exactly. How do you name alkanes when you have a branch? Okay, so here goes. The four rules that you need to know. The first thing you do, you look at your structure, like the one on bottom, you locate the longest continuous carbon chain. So let me ask you guys, how long, how many carbons is the longest continuous carbon chain for this example? One at the top, like. One at the top, so how many carbons? Seven, seven. Okay, I hear strictly sevens. Any other answers? See, it does look like seven, doesn't it? See, that, that wave at the top, and then you have a branch going down, right? Is it nine? It's nine. That's misleading. This is the longest continuous chain. It says continuous. It doesn't say it doesn't bend. All right, so you can go twist and turn all kinds of directions as long as it's continuous. So you must find the longest chain. So the answer is nine, not seven. Okay, there's only one correct answer. So make sure you don't fall for that trap. Many students fall for traps like that. Sometimes the molecule is drawn in a way that you know, is, 
It's there to mislead you. Make sure you always follow the path for the longest chain. Once you find the longest chain, you have to number the carbons in the chain, okay? And you will start at the end closest to the branch so that the number for the substitution is as small as possible. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, this is nine carbons, so this must be none, right? Remember that list? So let's number them. You can do this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You can do this in two ways. You can start from the bottom or you can start from the right side. Which set of numbers will give you the smallest possible combination of the substitution? The one started from the bottom or the one started from the right? Look at where the substitution is. It is either on carbon four or carbon six, it depends on which direction do you count from, all right? You will choose the set of numbers that will give you the smaller number. So four is smaller than six. You must count from the bottom. So this set of number will, will be the correct numbering of the carbons, okay? You will choose a direction to count such that the set of numbers you get will be as small as possible for the substitution. So as a result, this branch right here is located on carbon four, not carbon six. If you say carbon six, you count it from the wrong direction, you get the name wrong. So name the branch. You have one carbon. Methyl has one carbon. That's the methyl branch, okay? So after you've done all this, you found the longest chain, you number the carbon so that the substitutions are as small as possible, you name the branches, you put it together. How do you put it together? Well, first you have the number of the substituted carbon. So which carbon has a substitution? Well, it's carbon number four. This doesn't mean four carbons have a substitution. This means carbon number four has a substitution. What is that substitution? What is the branch name? It's methyl. And what is the name of the longest chain, the parent chain? Well, that is not name. So you literally put it together like this. Number with a hyphen or a dash, name of branch, name of longest chain. Okay, so putting all of this together, you have four methyl nonane. That's it, that's the name. Please make sure you have the number to specify where do you find the methyl. Please make sure you have a hyphen, a dash that separates a number with a letter. You always separate a number and a letter with a dash. You can't just omit that dash. And there is no space between methyl and non-name. Does that make sense? So naming is a very rigorous and strict exercise. You must follow the rules perfectly. Normally, I don't care about spelling. If you spell a word wrong, as long as it can recognize what you're trying to spell, I don't care, I won't take off marks. But for naming, spelling matters. You must spell this correctly. If you misspell, you will lose marks for misspelling. It's like if you sign a legal document and you spell your name wrong, that, that's not acceptable, you have to redo it. Okay, naming is very strict. You must have the hyphen. So on your test, if I ask you to name something, I will enter an answer key and you must match mine perfectly. If you just miss one letter or one comma or one dash, you will lose marks. The machine will mark it wrong and I will agree with the machine that it is wrong. So you have to get one precise answer and that's it. So you have to follow the rules to the dot, okay, does that make sense? Let's look at a harder one. What if you have many branches? Okay, that one had one branch, this one has two branches. Now if you have many branches and it turns out they're all different, well, which one do you write first in the name? Well, you list them in alphabetical order according to the first letter. Okay, remember, there's only one possible answer for all of these. 
you can't have two equally good answers. No, one of them must be better than the other because of a certain rule that you have to know. So the order is the alphabetical order with the first letter that starts the alkyl group. Okay, that's the order. And then you just do the same thing. You number the carbon so that you have the smallest set of numbers for the substitutions put the hyphen between the number and the letter. So let's do this one. The longest carbon chain is this one. You can, of course, go down. Um, if you just start from the right side, you, you count to the left. When you get to the second last carbon, you can go down instead of continuing. It doesn't matter. You have the same number, okay? I just happen to choose that one because, you know, it's in the straight line. It looks nice. But if you decide to go down, who cares? That's the longest chain. If you count, octane because you have eight carbons in the parent chain that's the longest one all right so let's number this you can go from the left or you can go from the right obviously you go from the left okay remember you pick the set that gives you the smallest possible numbers for the groups you can either have a two four for your substitution or if you go from the right you can have a five seven obviously two four is smaller than five seven you pick that one, all right? That is a methyl, because it has one carbon, so that's a two methyl. This one is an ethyl, because it has two carbons, so that's a four ethyl. Notice that I use red for the first letter because of alphabetical order. To finally put them together, ethyl should come before methyl, because E comes earlier than M in the alphabet. So you would have 4-ethyl, 2-methyl, octane. See those hyphens that separates the letters from the numbers? You must have them. That 2 has two dashes coming out of it because it's surrounded by two letters. Now, is this clear? All right. I don't hear a question. So let's work on these guys. So I'll give you four minutes, so two minutes per question. Name these two. Remember, there's only one correct answer, and then I'll take it up in four minutes, and you match yours with mine to see whether it's exactly the same, all right? All right, uh, for the first one, you have to count the longest chain first, and it happens to be this one. Now, it doesn't really matter at the intersection you decide to go up. It will be the same thing. So I prefer this one because it just looks nicer. So you count eight carbons in the parent, so you would have octane. You can number this in one of two ways. You can go from the left or to the right. And obviously, going from the left nets you three. Whereas if you go from the right, you get a six. So going from the left is preferred. So the number of the substitution is at carbon three. So you would have a three ethyl. This would be a three methyl. So finally putting everything together, E comes before M. So that means you have three ethyl, three methyl octane. Does that make sense? Now the next one is a pretty tough one compared to the ones we've been doing. Identifying the longest chain, it's gotta be that one. That is the longest one with 10, so decane. And you can number from the left or from the right. And from the left, you would have three, five, six. Whereas from the right, you would have five, six, eight. And three, five, six is obviously smaller. You pick the set counting from the left. All right, and once you do that, you can start naming the branches. On the carbon three, you have a methyl, so three methyl. On carbon five, you have an ethyl, so that's five ethyl. And then on carbon six, you have a propyl, so this means this is six propyl. Does that make sense? Putting this together, alphabetical order E comes before M, which comes before P. So you have 5-ethyl, 3-methyl, 6-propyl, decane. 
Okay, and don't forget the dashes that separate the numbers and the letters and no spaces anywhere. Okay, did you all get that? If you didn't, uh, figure out why you got it wrong, what mistake you made, and make sure that you, know, you minimize mistakes like that. There are many ways to go wrong here. You could have counted from the wrong side. You could have labeled the wrong longest chain. Maybe you didn't do this alphabetically. Maybe you spelled it wrong. You know, there are many ways to go wrong. So please make sure that you get this down. All right, moving on. It does get more complicated. If you have a repeated group, that means you have two of the same group on your backbone, then how would you name this? Well, you will still number the carbons like normal and find the smallest set of numbers. But if you have the same branch, let's say you have two metals, well, in that example, you would have two metals, then you have to separate the numbers with comma. Okay, and then still alphabetical order. And then also the prefix, mono, di, tri, tetra, well not mono because you wouldn't need one for one, but di, tri, tetra, the regular prefixes we learned in grade 10, those are needed to specify how many of those branches you have. If you have two methyls, this is a dimethyl. If you have uh, three, that would be a trimethyl. Okay, so let's actually do this one together. Step one. Find the longest chain. That would be your parent or your backbone. And it's gotta be that one. And again, you can have a choice at the intersection. You can go up or down. It doesn't matter. You're gonna end up with, how many is this? A seven. Okay, so heptane. So once you get heptane, you can start numbering. You go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Which one is preferred, from the left or from the right? Anyone? Uh, left. <clears throat> left. Okay, that one is an easy one. From the left, you would have two, two, four. Whereas from the right, you have four, six, six. And two, two, four is obviously smaller. You pick the one from the left. Which means this is two methyl. Okay. And this is also two methyl. So you have two of the same thing. And then this guy will be 4-ethyl. So put them together and notice what happens to the methyls. You would have 4-ethyl because alphabetically E comes from 4-M. 2 comma 2 dimethyl heptane. The many things to take note of here, 2 comma 2. There's a comma that separates the two twos. So when you have two numbers together, you must separate them with a comma. Whereas if you have a number and a letter, you use a hyphen, a dash, all right? Dimethyl, because you have two methyl groups, you have to use the prefix di. Okay, many people forget that. There are two twos. Okay, there's a two comma two. Why are there two twos? Why can't you just say, two dimethyl heptane because they're found on carbon number two, right? What the twos mean is that they represent the location at which the methyls are found. Each of those two twos serve a purpose. The first two tells you that one of the methyls is located on carbon two. The second two tells you that the other methyl is located also on carbon two. It is not redundant. You have to have both twos. If you just write one, two, then I know that one method is found on carbon two, but I don't know where the other method is found. It can be found on any other carbon. It doesn't have to be on the same carbon. It's just that for this one, they are on the same carbon. So you must show both twos. Okay, did I make myself clear? You must have it exactly like this. Question. If they were found on different um, carbons, would you just put the smaller number first? Yes, the smaller number goes first, exactly. Okay, you will still separate them with a comma to tell me on which carbons do you find your substitutions. All right, so <laughs> given this, 
please do this one. Okay, this is a tough one. It has many different branches. Some of them are the same, some of them are different. So please take like um, two to three minutes, work on this and I'll take this up. Okay, first thing, the longest chain. And there is no ambiguity, that one has to be the longest chain. Um, a total of 10 carbons. And you will count from <laughs> either the left or the right. So you have to make a decision here. If you count from the left, you have a 2-2, two, two, a 4-4, four, four, a 7-7. Seven, seven. But from the right, you have a 4-4, four, 7-7, four, seven, seven, nine, nine. So obviously the two four sevens are smaller. You pick that one. All right, so once you've decided a direction, you can start naming the branches. So that is 2-methyl. That is also 2-methyl. And there's another methyl that is a 7-methyl. Okay, so you have three methyls in total. This guy will be a 4-ethyl. And there's another 4-ethyl below that. And that said, you have two ethyls. And then lastly, you have a propyl, and it's a found on carbon-7, so 7-propyl. You got to put everything together alphabetically, E before M before P. So you would get this long name, 4,4-diethyl, okay, because they're both found on carbon-4, 2,2,7-trimethyl, because again, there are three methyls found on carbon-2, carbon-2, and carbon-7, and then you have 7-propyl-decane. Okay, notice the alphabetical order. E before M before P. It doesn't matter if there's a tri in front of the methyl. I'm looking at the methyl, not the tri. You see what I mean? The prefix, they don't count towards the alphabetical order. It's the E versus the M versus the P. It doesn't matter what the prefix is. So this is the only possible answer to this question. If you got something different, um, again, you have to figure out why you got that wrong answer so that you don't make that mistake again. Clearly, none of this can be memorized. It's all understanding and applying the different rules. So make sure you really know the rules well. Uh, I have a question for the um, naming for 227, for example. Yeah. Um, if we have 4, 4, and there's a 5, there's an ethyl in the 5, do we write 4, comma 4, comma 5, triethyl? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. You would just... List out every single number. You have. You should have the same amount of numbers and the amount of groups you have. You see what I mean? You must list all of them out. It's not redundant. You have to tell me where each of those belong. All right, so you good? Yep. All right, so that does it for the naming of alkanes. This is the fundamental lesson on naming every other naming lesson that comes after is based on this one okay make sure you really practice this okay let's move on to reactions of alkanes and some properties of alkanes so an alkane is basically just a hydrocarbon okay it literally just has carbon and hydrogen so as a result is not very reactive because those bonds tend to be pretty stable so it is not looking to change but we can burn them for energy. And in fact, we do that a lot. So we burn them via complete combustion reactions, which we learned in grade 10 and 11. Basically, you take a hydrocarbon, in this case, butane, you burn that in the presence of oxygen. That's what burning means. You need oxygen for this. React that with oxygen. The products are always going to be carbon dioxide, water, and some energy. Like it's always the same. It's just that the numbers in front could be different. It depends on what hydrocarbon you burn. The purpose of burning hydrocarbons is to release heat energy, to use the heat for other purposes. Okay. The carbon dioxide and water are just products that happens to come out with the heat. We don't really have the use for those. In fact, climate change is caused by the carbon dioxide that's being released. That's not what we want. We want heat. So an example will be methane. Well, we burn natural gas to heat homes. And many homes depend on this. Butane is used for cans. Uh, you can buy this at the supermarket. You can just pop one in. You can either do a hot pot or a barbecue. You just burn the gas in the butane can. 
Octane is used in automobiles. So you go to the gas station, you fill up with Octane. Okay, that, that actually has a label on it at the gas station. And Octane is an eight carbon molecule. So this is literally the fuel that we're burning. So now you know why it's called Octane. If you look at the properties of alkanes, um, this table goes down the list from methane all the way down to decane. The formula goes one, two, three, four, five, six, and we just increase by one carbon. The molar mass obviously increases as you go down, but I really want to focus on the boiling point. The boiling point is the temperature at which it becomes a gas, right? Now, if you have methane, it's called natural gas. It's obviously the gas on Earth. You need negative 162 degrees in order for this to become a gas. That means if you want liquid methane, you have to be colder than that. No one on Earth is that cold, not even Toronto. But on other planets and other moons of planets, um, you could have liquid methane. I believe on some moons of Jupiter or Saturn, I can't uh, remember which one exactly, maybe it's the moon of Uranus or Neptune. It is that cold and you would have a liquid methane. All right. Now, ethane has two carbons and the boiling point goes up to negative 89 degrees, still really cold. You're not gonna have liquid ethane on Earth unless you just set the side plant in a lab. But the boiling point is much higher, all right? Negative 89 because it has more electrons. The London forces become stronger. Propane, um, again, higher boiling point still. Butane hits zero as a boiling point. So above zero, butane is a gas. Below, it becomes a liquid. And then you have pentane, hexane, all the way down to decane. And if you check out octane gasoline from the pump, the boiling point is 126 degrees Celsius. In order for this to become a gas, you need to boil that to 126 degrees, which we don't have on Earth. Nowhere is that hot. So that's why you have a liquid that comes out of the pump. But we still say gas, and I need to get gas. Well, because you know, octane can be a gas, you just have to boil that. And if you just check out the number of isomers, the number of isomers are one for the first three because there's only one possible way to represent methane, ethane, and propane. There's no way to rearrange carbon to get something new. But starting at four, you have options, okay? You can move things around. It's like playing with Lego pieces. You can build, let's say, a Death Star, and then you can take that apart and build a chair. Same Lego pieces, um, you used all of them, and it's a different shape, so that will be an isomer. You can have different isomers, and the number of isomers increase as the number of carbons increase, which makes sense because you can have more combinations. Okay, does that make sense? So, Alkanes typically have low boiling points because of their non-polarity. These guys are all non-polar because of the hydrogen carbon bonds. They are not really you know, polar. They don't have a large difference. Even if they do, the symmetry will still give you a net dipole of zero. So all of this is explained via London forces. Octane is a liquid because of the high London forces. It has a lot of electrons. Eight carbons is a lot. All right, so now let's look at the formulas. How do you predict how many hydrogens is given to carbon? Keep in mind, this only works for alkanes. Other organic compounds have different formulas. Cn, H, 2n plus 2. Okay, N refers to how many carbons you have. The amount of hydrogen is just 2n plus 2. So let's look at methane. One carbon, so N is 1. So hydrogen would be two times one plus two, which is four. So CH4 makes total sense. Okay, one carbon, four bonds. If you have butane, um, N would be four, so you have four carbons. So hydrogen is two times four plus two, that is 10. So C4H10. So basically you can predict how many hydrogens you would have if you have a saturated hydrocarbon, an alkane. If you have 100 carbons, you will have 202 hydrogens. You just apply the formula. And lastly, structural isomers, same formula, but different arrangement of atoms, All right? But you have the same amount of every single type of atom, just they're bonded differently. So here's an example, C5H12, 
five carbons, 12 hydrogens. There are many ways of drawing C5H12 because you don't know what the specific structure looks like. It could be any one of these three. Okay, if you want to name the first one, that's just pentane. Five carbon chain, that's pentane. The second one, that would be two methylbutane. Okay, not three methylbutane. It's not on the third carbon. If you come from the right side, it's on the second carbon. So two methylbutane. Always pick the smallest set of numbers. But they have five carbons and exactly 12 hydrogens, just like pentane. There's no difference. Third one, uh, the longest chain is three. So it's 2,2-dimethylpropane. All of these are C5H12. You see what I mean? So that's why the molecular formula is not very helpful. It doesn't distinguish between which one. Okay, how about that one? What is that? Is that right? One methyl butane, right? On the first carbon, you have a methyl. Is that another isomer? Yes or no? No, because it's the same name. Like, yeah, hold, up, hold up, one at a time. No, because? Like, aren't there two methyl butanes? Like, there's already a methyl butane there, like at the top. Right. Like There's also a two methyl butane, but this is one methyl butane, so it's different from two methyl butane. Is it just pentane? I'm sorry. Is it just pentane? The first one? No, oh, that that's just pentane. Well, first of all, that's wrong. You can't have that. Because here's why. You take this thing, you straighten that out, guess what? You get pentane. Okay, that's exactly right. This is the same as pentane. It's just that you made a little turn, but that doesn't change anything. You're still one continuous chain of five carbons. In fact, Lewis diagrams are inaccurate because they fail to depict the correct bond angles. The angles between the carbons and the hydrogen, they're not 90 degrees. Remember, they're zigzags, okay? And those angles can rotate. You can rotate the bonds so basically, it doesn't matter if you bend them because a rotation will just get you the same thing. So in fact, don't fall for that trap. This is pentane. You never have a one methyl. You see what I mean? Because think about it, one methyl, you have a methyl on the first carbon. Why don't you just extend that and have an additional carbon for your parent? One methyl butane, that is the same as pentane. Just count the methyl as part of the parent. We have five carbons, so don't be fooled. Many people got fooled just because you bent the molecule, you think that's another branch, okay? So there are, in fact, only three isomers of C5H12. So this is the last exercise in this lesson. Draw all the isomers of C6H14. Okay, um, I'm gonna tell you right now, there are five isomers of this. Try to come up with all five. So I'll give you some time, uh, around two minutes, and I'll take them up. All right, so there are five isomers. The first one is very obvious. Just he hexane, six carbons in a long chain. All the other ones are just basically you rearrange the branches to stick it on um, that parent to make a branch. So the first thing that comes to mind is probably this. Right? You break one, you stick it on the next carbon. So that would be um, two methyl pentane. You can, of course, uh, you take that branch instead of putting on carbon two, you stick it in the middle. So three methyl pentane. So I'm sure that's what most of you came up with. So now you have to get creative. So how do you make the other ones? Well, you could do that. You can have a double branch. So now your parent becomes four. That would be 2,3-dimethylbutane. And the last one might be a little bit difficult to think of. Okay, what else can you do? Well, who's to say that they can't be on the same carbon? So you can have two branches on the same carbon. So this is 2,2-dimethylbutane. That's it. That's the only five isomers of C6, 
age 14. If you think you have more, you're mistaken. All right, do we have any questions? No, we're good. Why can't I have um, a methyl, I mean an ethyl group? Why can't you have a methyl group on which one? Like if I have four carbons and then on the second one, I put a methyl group. Is that not a structural isomer? If you have four carbons and just one methyl group, you don't, you don't have enough carbons. You have five carbons in total. You need six. Sorry, an ethyl group, not a methyl group. Oh, an ethyl group. Okay. So you're saying you have a four carbon chain with an ethyl group, right? Yeah. So basically exactly like the one on bottom left. Oh. You see what I mean? If you just view it in a different way, four carbon <laughs> chains, you don't actually have an ethyl group. You have to be careful. If you add an ethyl group to the second carbon, what you're really doing is adding a methyl group to the third carbon. You see what I mean? You don't count the ethyl, you count the methyl because you want the longest chain possible. But, but how is the bottom left one different with the, the one like above him? How is that different? Because the branch is on a different carbon. The one above it is on carbon two. The one below is in, is in the middle on carbon three. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Any other if questions? You, if you have one on carbon four, it's the same as the one on carbon two. Exactly. And now if you move the branch over one, so you're on carbon four, right? No, just turn around, you're carbon two. So those would be exactly identical. Okay, we're clear, we're good. All right, and so this will be your first lesson in organic chemistry, okay? I'm going to end this here.